Hi, my name's Howard Cooper, and I'm the men's pastor here at Calvary Baptist Church. And this is my story. It started when I was 13 years old, and I was out riding bikes with friends, and we came across a, a graphic magazine in the gutter. Typical kids, we picked it up and looked at it, and threw it back down and kept on riding. I came back and got it. And that's what began a 40-year addiction to pornography. During that time, I ended up meeting my girlfriend. And at, when I turned 21, we married. She was pregnant. We continued on with that marriage for an additional 20 years. And in that 20-year period, I continued with an addiction to pornography that I felt was no problem and, and no, no uh, hindrance to the, to the marriage. But in fact, it was. I, uh, I had abandoned my wife emotionally and physically for my own needs. Even though the, the marriage lasted 20 years, it ended in divorce because of her infidelity, and I had no idea why. The reason for that, obviously, was me, and it was all my fault. I pushed her away. I wasn't the husband I should be with her. And it was at that time that it came to realization that something wasn't right with me. Moving forward eight years, I remarried. And in the first five years of that marriage, I brought that addiction with me to that next marriage. And it wasn't until I was uh, sitting out at the beach with the men's life group, having a Bible study, that God put on my heart to share that problem that I was having. That was a continuing cycle. That was a repentance, asking forgiveness, feeling shame, and continuing down that path for the past four years. And at that point, the, the desires was, was lifted from me. I had you know, that went away. I haven't had the desire to, to indulge in pornography since then. Granted, there's temptations there all the time, but we continue to struggle. Uh, all men do. One of the biggest things that I did was, number one, to become transparent with my, with my brothers. And that came through, the, through a, an app, an electronic app called Covenant Eyes, or there's another one called X3 Watch. Either one of them is an amazing. It gives accountability for anything that I'm on an electronic device with to those other gentlemen. They can see what I'm viewing and they can call me on it if I do something silly. And that's really awesome. And here at Calvary, all of our staff, all of our male staff has that same accountability on, on all of our devices. Guys, I'm talking to you right now. I want you to know that you can be set free from the addiction and shame of pornography. We're here for you. The men's ministry is here for you. The other pastors are. I'd love to talk to you and help you get through this and know that you can be set free from the addiction to pornography. Well, if it's not obvious, today we are moving up forward in our Unleashed series and we are talking about love and lust. Our main passage of scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8 and 11. Now, I want to remind you, we are one church with three locations. Parker, we love how God is using you. You are reaching your friends and your family. Uh, the church campus there is growing. We are so excited about what God is doing. I'm going to be there next week, and I can't wait to be there with you. We're going to be preaching about fear and faith. So invite a friend, invite a family member, and I'd love to meet you. I'd love to hang out with you for a little bit and uh, invite that friend and family to see what God is doing there on our Parker campus. If you don't have a Bible, we want to welcome you to use a Bible that's located underneath the seat in front of you. And Parker Campus, it's located on the table right in the back of the room. You can hop up right now and go back and grab that Bible and come back to your seat. Uh, Bible's located underneath your seats in front of you. You can grab that Bible and turn to page 1000. 140. If you don't own a Bible that you can read and understand easily, I want to encourage you, please take that Bible home. It won't hurt our feelings one bit. In fact, we would love for you to have a Bible in your home that you can read and that you can understand easily. That's why they're there. We want you to have it, take it, read it, and apply it to your life because we love when God's people experience life change. It's an awesome thing. Life change is an amazing thing, and all of us, as we heard from the video, all of us continue to experience God changing our lives. Now, as we talk about love and lust, we hear and use the word love probably a hundred times a week. Raise your hand if you have social media. 
Social media of any form. Okay. I went back through my social media posts and I looked for all the times that I used the word love. I love this. I love that. And I, I want to show you just a few examples of the times I used the word love. On June 10th, 2019, I said, I love running into old friends. I don't have to explain the picture. Those are old friends. <laughs> February 26th, 2018. I wrote, tonight I brushed and dried all four daughters' hair after baths. I used to do it all the time. Now it seems I barely do. I love the daddy-daughter time with them and don't want those little moments to go away so fast. Hashtag girl power. Hashtag little blessings. April 27, 2019, I posted about a video. It was Andy Grammer and a children's choir singing Don't Give Up On Me. And I just love that video. We couldn't post it or we couldn't show it to you, but it was a great song. And then the third, December 11, 2016, I said, uh, I wrote, Happy Anna. Was that picture up there for Andy Grammer? Well, that is not Andy Grammer. That is my wife. <laughs> I wrote, Happy Anniversary, Christy. 17 years have gone by in the blink of an eye, and I wouldn't trade them for anything, except maybe my dog. But that's it. <laughs> I wouldn't trade them for anything else. Well, I guess my lamp. But that's it. No more. I love you and wouldn't give anything for the last 17 years except my dog and my lamp and my chair. But that's it. Nothing else. <laughs> that's obviously sarcasm. It's sarcasm, Christy. It's sarcasm. <laughs> you know, we use the word love so many times a day and in different ways. And notice that the way I use the word love, even in those posts, didn't always mean the same thing. I hope it's clear to you that I don't love my children like I love a song. Or that I don't love old friends the way I love my wife. But I use that word love uh, the same way. I spelled it the same way. If we want to be unleashed from lust, if lust is one of those things that are hangups in your life, if we want to be unleashed from lust, we must first understand, as in the words of the great philosopher Forrest Gump, what love is. We have to understand what love is, and the Bible uses the word love and teaches the word love in many different ways. We're going to look at four of those ways tonight. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 8 and then we're going to jump to verse 11 on page 1104. Paul wrote this about love. Love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Jump to verse 11. Paul wrote, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For years, biblical scholars have recognized four types of love mentioned throughout the Bible. And the first type of love is the love of choice. Romans 5.8, we see that love of choice in Romans 5.8, uh, where Paul writes, God demonstrated his own love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God chose to love us. God still chooses to love us. There's nothing about us that God says, you are amazing outside the fact that he chooses to love us. We see this type of love when God, uh, or we see this type of love when a parent chooses to adopt a child into their family. 
they choose to love that child and raise that child as their very own flesh and blood. That is a love of choice. It's the type of love that chooses to bring food to the homeless uh, person on the corner. It's the type of love that chooses to pay the light bill for a neighbor down the street that's struggling. This is a love of choice. It's not mushy. It's not feeling oriented. It's not a warm hearted type of love. It is a love that insists on denying self. It's a love that insists on putting other people first. It's a love of choice. This is the love that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, here are some practical ways that we can live out this love. Uh, you can choose to leave a large tip when you get crappy service. That's, that's showing love. That's choosing to. You might not feel like it. You might not feel you didn't get good service. Therefore, you don't feel like you should give good service. But a love of choice says, I'm going to choose to demonstrate love and leave an incredibly large tip. And it also means you have to be kind while you're getting the bad service. You can't be mean and then give a bad, uh, good tip, okay? So choose, show that love of choice. Choose to take the first step to reconcile a broken relationship. You may not feel it, you may not desire it, but you can choose to take that first step to reconcile a broken relationship. You can be the, uh, choose to be the first person to apologize in an argument because love is gentle. You can choose to demonstrate that type of love. You can choose to help fund a mission trip. You can choose to sponsor a compassion child. You can choose to bring food in to stock the local pantry that we're doing through the month of November. That's all a love of choice. It's choosing to demonstrate love. Again, it's not rooted and based on feelings or mushiness. And you can choose to receive that type of love as well. John 1, 12, the apostle John wrote, to, but, to, but to all who believed him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. I accepted God's love in 1991 and God made me his child. I experienced life change. And today at the close of our service, after the last song is sung, our prayer team will be here at the front. And if today is the day that you desire to accept God's love and forgiveness, if you choose to accept God's love and forgiveness, you can do that today. Parker Campus, that includes you. The prayer team will be there at the front of the stage, and they would love to pray with you to give you that opportunity as you choose to accept Christ as your Savior. Now, the second type of love is this. It's family love. Now, I'm not giving you the Greek words. I'm giving you kind of the today's modern equivalent. Uh, the Greek word, I'm not going to give it to you, but we have people here that could. It's family love. Uh, this is the love that you have for your parents, for your siblings, for your cousins, for your aunts and your uncles. It is that fondness that you have for them, sometimes only because they're family. You can't choose your family, can you? But you can choose to uh, have that fondness or you can experience that fondness for them. You, Uncle Ronnie, Aunt Kathy, because you have that fondness for them because they are your family and you're stuck with them. And sometimes we grow apart from our families. Sometimes after we move away or we move out, our relationships can become strained disagreements that we have with family members become magnified stubbornness settles in and sometimes people wait until it's too late to apologize to those family members i've been to too many funerals where somebody has lost a family member and they cry and they're broken and they wish that they had apologized they wished that they had shown humbleness and humility and, and let that individual know how sorry they were and how much they loved them. Why? Because they were family and they meant something to them. So how can you demonstrate this type of love today? Well, children, you can demonstrate this type of love by simply being obedient to your parents. Just be obedient to your parents. Listen to what they have to say. Pick up your room for crying out loud. And parents, you can demonstrate this type of love with your family members, with your children, by not being harsh to them, 
by being gentle, firm, but gentle with your words and demonstrating kindness. If you have parents who are now super senior adults, pick up the phone and call them. Call them once a day if it requires that. But if they're super senior, if they're, if they're aged, if they're lonely, especially if they're in an assisted living facility, help them in some way. Demonstrate that type of love to them because they're your parents and they gave you life. Siblings, you can demonstrate this type of love with each other by not killing each other. You can demonstrate this type of love with one another by being kind to each other in front of your parents. It will blow their mind. And for all of us, make sure that our family knows that we love them. Say the words, I love you often to one another. Say the words to your brother and to your sister. Say the words to your aunts and your uncles. Let your family know that you do love them and you do care about them. The third form of love is my favorite form of love. It's the marital love. Marital love. And marital love is the type of erotic love that a husband and wife experience together. It is physical, it is sexual, it is a romantic love that God designed for husbands and wives to experience together. Do you remember those days when you were flirting with that spouse of yours? When your eyes would light up when you would see them coming? Or when their eyes would light up or when that flutter in the heart would occur? Or maybe you even lost your breath when you began to speak to them. And it's not because you were out of breath. It's because you just didn't know what to say. That type of love begins in dating, the flirting, the dating, the romantic attraction, and it grows and it matures and it seasons in marriage. Now, outside of the covenant of marriage, it's important that you all understand this because even if you're older and you're, you've gone through, maybe this is your second or third marriage, it's very important for your second or third relationship it's very important that you understand and grasp this, that outside the covenant of marriage relationship, that marital love brings destruction. It can hurt and ruin relationships. I liken it to a fireplace inside a house. A fireplace inside the house is that marital love. And when that fire is burning bright inside the fireplace, there is warmth and there's kindness, and there's that glow of love throughout the house, and everybody in the house experiences that warmth and the benefit of the fire. But when that marital love, that physical erotic love, moves outside the bonds of marriage, it is like a fire that moves outside of a fireplace, and it burns down the entire house. It's a fire that wasn't designed to eat up and destroy and ruin relationships. That fire is there between a husband and wife to provide warmth and light and security for the whole family. So let me ask you a question, spouses. Are you as romantic as you once were? Raise your hand if your spouse is not as romantic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> because my wife would raise her hand and she would say to you, Joe... You used to write me love poems. You used to send me flowers. You used to call me all the time just to see how I was doing and hear my voice. And you don't do that anymore. Maybe on Mother's Day, maybe on the anniversary, you might get a poem, but not like I once did. So let me ask you, and I'm sorry for that. I love you. Spouses, do you still flirt with each other? Do you still look at each other and flirt with your eyes or flirt with your lips or flirt with your body? Are you still sassy to each other the way that you once were? Reach out for your spouse's hand right now if your spouse is here. Reach out for your spouse's hand and hold it. Just their hand. <laughs> Has it been a long time since you've held your spouse's hand? Has it been a long time since you've gone for a walk together and you've talked together? I, I want to encourage you, go to five, it's the, the number five, fivelovelanguages.com 
and anybody can do it. It's a free short assessment to learn what your spouse's love language is because you need to love your spouse the way they experience love, not the way that you want to show love. Your spouse is wired differently than you. And so you want to learn what your spouse's love language is so you can begin to love him or her the way that God has wired them to receive love. It's a free assessment. Now, yes, you'll have to give them your email address. Yes, you'll get spam email from them. But it's worth it because it's a free assessment that can help you in your marriage to demonstrate uh, love to one another. And spouses, let your spouse flirt with you again. Now, if they begin to flirt with you and you slap them and say, don't do that, let them, let them flirt with you. Let them whisper something sexy in your ear from time to time. Not something dirty, but something sexy in your ear. Receive that love because God has given us that marital form of love to experience and to enjoy. And finally, that fourth type of love is a brotherly love. We see it in passages like Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This brotherly type of love is that one another type of love. It's a warm love in your heart for other brothers in Christ and for other sisters in Christ. It's maybe that first type of love that you, you first experienced when you gave your life to Jesus and, and you became a follower of Christ and you felt like you were knitted, uh, knitted, your hearts were knitted together with other believers, maybe in that church family. It's a warm, encouraging type of love. It's that same type of love that Paul demonstrates over and over again to other believers. It's a love that proves that we are followers of Christ. It's a sincere interest in the lives of other believers. So how can you show that type of love today? How about learning somebody's name today? How about introducing yourself to somebody else and saying, hey, my name's Bob and I just want to say hi. What's your name? I see you here week after week. It's allowing the Spirit of God to knit our hearts, hearts together. Invite another believer out to eat with your family and pay for their bill. Say, I just want to get to know you. Let God knit hearts together. Join a life group. Ask God to knit your hearts together with those individuals in that life group. Serve on one of our ministry teams. Serve in the children's ministry and get to know the other children's ministry leaders. Serve on our tech team and get to know the other tech leaders. Understand that our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And how do we know that we're leading people to life change if we don't fully understand what love is? And when we don't do love right, we can mistake love for lust. So let's talk about lust. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, lust is usually an intense unbridled sexual desire. It's an intense longing or craving. I want you to know, don't write that down. Miriam Webster is wrong. They're wrong. I have an intense longing and craving for my wife. Does that mean I'm lusting after her? Or does that mean I, I'm practicing that marital form of love? What's the marital form of love? Lust is an intense sexual desire or craving for something that is forbidden. It's for something that is off limits. That's what lust is. And when we don't understand fully what love is, we mistake it or we mistake lust for love. And I think I said that wrong a moment ago. Because we have an intense sexual desire for something that is off limits, pornography exists today. It's because we lust. Pornography exists today. Pornography addictions are real. They are damaging. They hurt families. They hurt marriages. And pornography addictions 
hurts the body of Christ. Understand this. Love will bless your life. Lust can destroy your life. See, when followers of Jesus give in to lust and view pornography, as you even heard in our video, they wrestle with shame, with guilt. They isolate themselves from other believers in Christ because they feel ashamed and they feel embarrassed about what they have allowed lust to lead them into. They are afraid to admit their, to admit their struggle. They are afraid to ask for help. And so they often hide in the shadows of the church until they eventually even quit going to church. See, they're, they're too afraid to get involved in ministry. They're too afraid to, get in, to, to ask for accountability. Their relationships with other believers begin to crumble. Their relationships with their family begins to crumble. Their relationship with their spouse begins to crumble. And this is not just a man-woman issue. The numbers are staggering how the percentage of internet pornography users, women, are continuing to grow higher and higher and higher. And that shouldn't take us by surprise. Because if husbands and men are giving into pornography and they're not spending that physical attention to their spouse, then where are their spouses going to turn? The wives are also going to be turning to the internet. When believers struggle with pornography, they don't experience brotherly love or sisterly love to its fullest potential because there's always a portion of themselves that they keep hidden from the world and hidden in the shadows. Lust and pornography can skew our view of what real intimacy is. So remember this. Lust has no substitute. I'm sorry, love has no substitute. Lust is a counterfeit. There is nothing as great as love. As we talked about those four types, as we read 1 Corinthians 13, and if you read on through 1 Corinthians 13, as Paul wraps it up, he says there's nothing greater than love. There's nothing that will out-exist love. Love will last forever. But lust is a fake form of love. It's counterfeit. We deceive ourselves and think it's the real deal. We trick ourselves into thinking that giving into lust fills, uh, fills a void of love in our lives. But we are so wrong. When we do not practice love as we should, or when we do not receive love as we hope to receive it, we settle for the counterfeit of love, which is lust. We settle for something far less than what God desires us to experience. And if you are a follower of Jesus and you give in to lustful cravings by watching pornography, there is help. I don't want you to feel alone. I don't want you to feel abandoned. I don't want you to feel isolated. Thousands of men and women, millions of men and women give in to pornography. Millions of men and women feel that addiction, but there is help. As mentioned in the video, I want every family to pull out your smartphone and type in the web address covenanteyes.com. And after the sermon's over, when you're going home or after you get home, I want you to pull it up and I want you to begin to look at it because it's a filter and it's an accountability software. So it's an internet filter to help protect your young family, protect your children from pulling up images that would be damaging to their minds and to their hearts. And it's also that filter that will protect you from pulling up those images that can damage you. And also uh, it's an accountability software where everywhere you go online, is logged and it's sent to an accountability partner of your choosing. And the greatest thing of it about it is this, if you disable covenant eyes, you don't get on the internet. It's fantastic. 
I have it on my tablet. I have it on my phone. I have it on my daughter's phone. It's on my wife's phone. We want our eyes to be guarded and protected. I want their little eyes to be guarded and protected. And I want to do all I can to be a follower of Jesus that Christ has called me to be. And I want to be able to love my wife and love my family the way that God has wired me to. And I want to protect myself from lust. See, the reason why people often feel beat up and defeated when you view pornography, it's because the passions of the flesh are waging war against your very soul. Peter was an apostle. He was a married. Is that thunder? What a rare occasion in Havasu we have thunder. You still must stay seated. Parker, you probably heard thunder just now. 1 Peter 2.11, the Apostle Peter was a married man. He was a follower of Jesus. And this is what he said. He said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Giving into pornography, you're keeping a war going against your very soul. I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation. I'm saying it damages who you could be in Christ. It damages the man or the woman of God that you could become. And to echo what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he said, when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Is it time for the boy in you to sit down and for the man in you to stand up and begin loving like God has wired you to love? Is it time for the girl in you to sit down and for the godly woman in you to stand up and begin to love as God has wired you to love? I say it is. And I say protecting your family and protecting your marriage is worth it. So pay the subscription price and stop eating out so much. Purchase Covenant Eyes, load it onto your computer, and begin to experience a freedom that you've never or that you've longed to experience as a follower in Christ. And it's because when we live a life of love, it changes lives. When we live a life of love, and when you're free from lust to live a life of love, you will be seeing God using you to change other people's lives. And it is amazing when God begins to love others through you because you've made yourself a clean vessel set apart for God to use. That's what I want us all to experience. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say thank you first and foremost, for choosing to love us. Thank you for the love that you've demonstrated to us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. And Lord, I want to pray that you would help all of us to experience a, a life free from shame, free from guilt, free from isolation and free from embarrassment. I want to pray for every man, woman, and child in this room, God, that you would set them free from lust to experience the freedom to love others as you've wired us to love. Help us to become a body of believers that is known for seeing lives changed and transformed, not only here on the weekend, but also throughout our community by the way we show love to our friends, our family, our community, and to one another. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.